Weezer is a band with a sprawling, complex history, one that I've dedicated almost a year of my life to documenting. With ups, downs, corridors, weird tangents, and two cruises, they're stranger than your average band. But for everything I've discussed, there's one period I've barely touched upon. The Origins. On June 13th, 1970, a boy was born in Manhattan. His mother, Beverly Schoenberger, heard the sound of a river outside her hospital room and claimed that to be the reason for her son's unusual name, Rivers Cuomo. The boy's father, Frank Cuomo, had a different explanation for the name, claiming it instead to be in honor of three players in that year's World Cup, Italy's Gigi Riva and Gianni Rivera, as well as Brazil's Roberto Rivellino. The latter explanation sounds unlikely until you hear that he missed the birth of Rivers to watch the World Cup. Wow. If you think the weird names end there, Rivers' brother would be born a year later, Leaves Cuomo, and Leaves would go on to share an alternative name that Rivers almost had, Apple Cuomo, named after the city he was born in and my dog when I was four. In case you couldn't tell by the everything, our frontman was born into a family of hippies, raised in a Buddhist commune in upstate New York for the first five years of his life. However, in 1975, a major change would redefine this already unconventional status quo the departure of Frank Cuomo. Any fan of the band can tell you how massively influential this was in the life of Rivers. For decades, Cuomo's only contact with his father would be through letters. At the time, however, this just entailed Rivers moving from one Buddhist community to another, Yogaville. Though today it's seen by experts on the subject as a cult, at the time it was Rivers' home. Thus, he spent most of his childhood and formative years living in an ashram. To quote Rivers himself, isn't that insane? In 1976, Rivers' mother married Stephen Kitts, which was a massively important event in Rivers' life that was immediately overshadowed by what happened the next year. In 1977, a friend of Cuomo introduced him to Kiss. Her family had rock and roll over on vinyl, and they used to listen to it together constantly. We were all about six or seven years old, and when we heard Making Love or I Want You off that record, we just lost our minds. The guitar was so exciting, I remember we'd all just run around the room in circles playing air guitar and jumping off the furniture. Rivers had just met his true love rock music, and it shaped the rest of his life. That doesn't mean it was all smooth sailing from here, though. After his family left Yogaville in 1980, Rivers and his brother Leaves were faced with an all-new challenge, public school. Though Rivers struggled to fit in anywhere, it doesn't take a genius to tell you that going from a Buddhist commune to a middle school is a rough shift. To acclimate, Rivers and Leaves adopted new names, Peter and James Kitts, and even taught each other curse words. But none of it was enough. The two were bullied constantly, with Cuomo crediting this as the reason he grew up so shy. His one outlet was music. He joined the Columbia Record Club, a service in the latter decades of the millennia that encouraged people to buy records and tapes for a penny each. Not only did the young Cuomo by every single Kiss record, but he explored many other bands. Queen, ABBA, Eddie Rabbit, and basically every artist he mentioned in Heart Songs. The one passion at this time that could possibly match music was, shockingly, sports. The young Cuomo wanted to play American football professionally and had a strong love for the other football, just like his father. But a rare condition caused one of his legs to grow longer than the other, leading to his aspirations being cut short. Without access to team sports, Rivers' last chance at popularity was dust in the wind. He quickly became the worst thing you could possibly be in the 80s. A nerd. A dork. A geek. A dweeb. A goober. He developed interests in Star Wars, comics, and Dungeons and Dragons that today are considered rad, but in the 80s were bad. He didn't even like play as an orc or whatever, he preferred high dexterity. I mean, no wonder they bullied him. You may think this nerdiness is off topic, but you're dead wrong. Rivers' geeky side was just as important as his musical side for the origins of Weezer, as the Blue Album would eventually show. For now, though, the musical side was flourishing. In middle school, Rivers met his best friend, Justin Fisher, who shared his love for D&D and rock music. Together, they sat through an 8th grade talent show where some classmates covered Metal Health by Quiet Riot, and, to their surprise, Everyone loved it, especially some of the girls who rushed on stage after their performance. This was Rivers and Justin's sign to finally do what all young men eventually do. Hi. 
Titled Fury, Rivers' first band was a little undercooked, especially considering Cuomo had yet to learn guitar or even own one. Thankfully, that oversight was reconciled when Rivers' parents bought him one for his 14th birthday, a Stratocaster copy, which I've learned is not the same as a knockoff or a replica because guitars are confusing. The young musician couldn't care less about vernacular and dived headfirst into learning the instrument. He spent that summer practicing, listening to the radio, and working with his band, Fury. By the time he entered high school in September of 1984, he was a bona metalhead. With undying love for the Scorpions, Judas Priest, and you, 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 <clears throat> though Kiss remained his one true love, finally getting to see them that year on their Animalized tour. Now, you'd think a kid with a strong love of comics, D&D, Star Wars, and heavy metal would do great in an 80s high school setting, but for whatever reason, he was still bullied. It reached the point where Rivers was so frustrated with public school that he approached his Zen master about it? I went to my parents' Zen master and I said, life is shit, I want to shave my head and do this. He's like, you know what? Being a monk is shit too, so I can't advise that for you. What you should do is really listen to yourself and see what path would make you the most excited and just go for that, however crazy it seems. It took me about five seconds and I was like, I want to be a rock star. High school was defined by this ambition. Him and Justin slowly transformed Fury into a purely metal band, avant-garde, that to quote Rivers, was anything but. He took the band profoundly seriously, rehearsing for hours a day, almost every day. Any band member that didn't fit into Cuomo's rigorous work ethic was succinctly fired. Even Justin, Rivers' best friend, wasn't safe, nearly being kicked out over one night of partying. But for as antisocial as this life of endless ambition may seem, he nonetheless found himself gradually gaining friends. By his junior year, he was kind of the king of the outcasts, always surrounded by other nerds and metalheads. Again, seems off topic, but relevant for later in the story. By the time senior year rolled around, Rivers had grown appreciation for all music. Though he would never advertise it to his metal-loving friends, he was starting to appreciate the Beatles, the Beach Boys, even some 80s pop and classical music. His horizons were broadening, especially after high school, with Cuomo attending a five-week summer program at the Berklee School of Music. There, he met future member of avant-garde, Michael Santon, with whom he'd finally make his biggest decision yet. In 1989, at the young age of 19, Rivers Cuomo took the step that makes or breaks every young artist, moving to Los Angeles. He took with him the remaining members of avant-garde, Michael Stanton, Justin Fisher, and a bunch of other less important guys. I don't even... Your guess is as good as mine as to what's going on here. Together, they decided to rebrand as Zoom for marketability's sake, before dissolving entirely in 1990. The reason was simple. Cuomo was falling out of love with metal. He'd later state, Metal seemed kind of dumb, so I consciously repressed it. The genre didn't seem very relevant anymore, so I locked myself away with an acoustic guitar and started writing my own songs. This was almost entirely thanks to his new job at Tower Records. There, he was exposed to dozens of up-and-coming bands, mostly against his will, two of which having a massive influence on him, Pixies and Nirvana. These were River's new role models, inspiring a different path in his music and life. And this new path was shepherded by a co-worker at Tower, Patrick Finn. Finn was as important a friend to Rivers as he was an influence in Weezer, most critically for introducing him to two new people. Finn's roommate, Patrick Wilson, and his former classmate, Matt Sharp. Most important right now is Pat, as he and Cuomo immediately hit it off musically. Rivers had fallen in love with songwriting, and Pat was a great partner in that respect. As such, the two eventually, and inevitably, started a new band, 60 Wrong Sausages, formed in 1991 with Pat Finn and Jason Cropper. Oh, yeah, this is Jason Cropper. Great guy, just, uh, unfortunate. Ever heard of Pete Best? Actually, don't worry about it. Anyways, he's a great source for early Weezer knowledge. It's because of him that we know about River's next great transition. He quickly fell out of love with 60 Wrong Sausages and its aimlessness in favor of pursuing the highly promising world of alternative rock. Jason recalled a moment at an Italian restaurant the two worked at when Smells Like Teen Spirit came up on the radio. I'm cooking, Rivers is cleaning, and we're both just standing in the same kitchen, and that song comes on the radio in the first week of its release. And Rivers says, I should have written that. And I'm like, yeah, that's totally true. Because the music he was writing was improving in quality every day. 
Every day, he wrote a better song. Rivers had a bona fide one-way rivalry with Kurt Cobain, and it's as adorable as it is relatable. But it's true what Jason was saying. Though it's a stretch to say Rivers could have eventually written Smells Like Teen Spirit, he was writing a lot of music. He had started a new experiment called the 50 Song Project with Pat Wilson. During that time, he wrote My Name Is Jonas, The World Has Turned and Left Me Here, and Undone, The Sweater Song. He just kept writing constantly. I didn't want to get back into a band until I felt I had a bunch of songs that were good and that had cohesive style. That's a big reason why Weezer didn't have any indie cred before their first album. Rivers was just too much of a perfectionist to release anything. He simply compiled all the songs he was writing on one tape, titled Weezer, chosen mostly at random based on a childhood nickname his father had given him due to his asthma. In his letters, Frank Cuomo never used the H when writing Weezer, so neither did Rivers. The Weezer tape was kept under lock and key, however, one other band member did have access to it. Since Pat was a collaborator, he was able to give a copy to a mutual friend, Matt Sharp, who was so impressed that he moved to Los Angeles to form a band. That band was Weezer. On February 14th, 1992, when any other young men would have been out getting lucky, Rivers, Pat, Matt, and Jason formed a band. This new band went unnamed initially, which sort of tells you something about Rivers' mindset at this point. He was ready. After years of stagnation, Rivers finally kicked it into high gear and reached for his dream. The time for lollygagging and ruminating on band names was over. They were going to hit it big once and for all. He only chose the name Weezer at the last minute when asked by the booker of the band's first show. They closed for Dogstar on March 19, 1992, which of course was Keanu Reeves' band, in case the origin story wasn't weird enough. Already, Weezer didn't get off to a good start. All the ravenous Keanu fans were long gone by the time the boys went up to play, which foreshadowed all their future gigs. Nobody would come to our shows for months and months and months, Rivers told an interview. I remember Matt and I just finally collapsing, like nine months into the whole thing, and just looking at each other and saying, we must be crazy, we must have bad taste, because we thought this was cool and nobody was getting it. After years of preparation, Cuomo was losing hope. Worse yet, he was offered an alternative. All throughout the 90s, Rivers had been attending community college and getting incredible grades. I'm talking 4.0 GPA. And eventually, he received an offer from UC Berkeley. A scholarship, a stipend, an apartment, and even a parking space, according to Rolling Stone. It was difficult to turn down. In the early months of the band, a hierarchy was already forming. Matt Sharp took over Pat Wilson's role as Rivers' roommate, best friend, and second in command. So ultimately, the burden would fall on his shoulders. Get the band a record deal, or Rivers gets lost. This is according to Matt Sharp, who went on to have a complicated history with Weezer. Though he has motivation to exaggerate his influence in the group, this was years later, and parts of his story do align with what's verified, so... Sharp accepted the challenge, and in August of 1992, Weezer recorded the kitchen tape. This was the band's second demo. They'd already recorded their first in May to give to club owners, but this was the serious one. It was nicknamed Weezer's first album for that reason. They shopped it around for months, but after it failed to turn any heads, they made a third demo in November. This time, they were so short on money that they had to pay the demo's engineer with a pair of speakers. The first half of 1993 was defined by an aggressive and desperate search for a label. Sharp would later say, We were turned down by every single small, medium, and larger record label. We got very close to that album not being heard by anybody. With the clock ticking and hope dwindling, a light shone at the end of the tunnel. In May of 1993, Weezer opened for Sloan, who were signed to DGC, a subsidiary of Geffen. This put Weezer directly in front of some executives, and eventually in front of one important executive, Todd Sullivan. Todd was an a and representative for Geffen, who signed Weezer in June of 1993. The gamble paid off. A lifetime of effort, all for a chance at the big leagues. But that's just it, really. A chance. Getting signed to Geffen was the easy part. The boys had all heard horror stories of bands signed by labels and dropped before their first album, or finishing an album only for the label not to release it, or even finishing an album, releasing it, and then not being given tour support. All death sentences for a young band. Worse yet, Rivers was already growing doubtful of if he was fit for the rock star life. Weezer had won their first battle. But the war was only just beginning. 